Hi, my name is Atif Darwish, professor of OBGYN in Asset University, uh, Egypt. Today, I would like to discuss with you an important topic related to polycystic ovarian syndrome. As you know, it is associated with many medical conditions across nearly every specialty of medicine. So I'd like to review the current understanding of this syndrome and its associated medical conditions. Basically, polycystic ovarian syndrome is diagnosed by the presence of two of the following. Hyperandrogenism, clinically or biochemically, menstrual and ovulatory dysfunction, or ovarian change of polycystic ovary by ultrasonography. If you find two of these three criteria, you can find uh, you can have a diagnosis of polycystic ovary. And I have to stress on the recent recommendations that ultrasonographic diagnosis of polycystic ovary depends on the presence of at least 20 follicles with a diameter of 2 to 9 millimeters or ovarian volume more than 10 cubic centimeters. But these are the diagnostic criteria for polycystic ovarian syndrome in a female in the reproductive age, usually coming for menstrual abnormalities or infertility. But what about the other reproductive findings of polycystic ovary? Don't ignore that not only infertility or uh, menstrual irregularities are the main presentations of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. They may come with uh, miscarriage, with pregnancy complications, and sometimes with endometrial hyperplasia, particularly near the menopause. They have uh, also the sh may have some presentation of insulin resistance and hyper, uh, uh, which leads to hyperandrogenism and ovarian dysfunction, or metabolic presentations like being pre-diabetics, diabetics or having a cardiovascular risk or even malignancy. So these are the plethora of presentations of polycystic ovarian syndrome, and many of those women are obese. But don't ignore that some women with polycystic ovarian syndrome are lean, which represents around 20% of cases. And when you see a lean patient with a typical presentation of polycystic ovarian syndrome, don't underestimate the condition and don't tell her that you are not a polycystic ovarian patient because you are a thin individual. Because lean polycystic ovarian syndrome is found in around 20% of cases with normal, if not low, body mass index, may or may not have insulin resistance with typical uh, two female puberty maturation during adolescence like acne, irregular menstruation, or potential depression. While obese patients usually will present with more than average body mass index, insulin resistance, and typical symptoms of polycystic ovarian syndrome. But you should know that insulin resistance is not related to obesity, it's related to the pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So some authors mentioned that insulin resistance is inherent in polycystic ovarian syndrome regardless the body mass index and should be managed uh, as early as possible. Of course, metabolic, uh, hematologic, and lipid abnormalities in addition to psychologic and neurologic findings are more pronounced in obese patients and thin individuals. And the management plan for obese patients differ from the, uh, uh, differs from the uh, lean individuals being uh, stressing on the weight loss as a first-line therapy, lifestyle modification as a first-line therapy, while the uh, lean individuals uh, should receive uh, the nutrients, minerals, and vitamins to improve their health, and usually they respond to the ovarian uh, ovulation induction better than the obese patients.
the obese patients are more liable to hypertension, diabetes, and endometrial uh, hyperplasia as seen by ultrasonography as thickium. So when you are treating a case with polycystic ovarian syndrome, don't stress on infertility and menstrual irregularities only. You should focus on other findings that may be seen in your case. Like hyperandrogenism, abnormal time bleeding, menstrual, uh, metabolic disturbances, in addition to infertility or the other reproductive findings of polycystic ovary. Don't ignore that not only infertility or uh, menstrual irregularities are the main presentations of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. They may come with clinical hyperandrogenism is related to hyperinsulinism, which is uh, a basic finding in cases of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so you can see uh, hyperandrogenism clinically in around 70 to 80% of cases. Hirschutism is defined as excessive growth of terminal hair in an androgen-dependent areas of the body. Acne is an inflammatory disease of the subspecies glands characterized by uh, pimples, especially on the face, back, chest, and in severe cases by cysts and nodules resulting in scarring of the skin. In addition to alopecia, which is skin uh, hair loss in some areas of the skin. These findings are more pronounced in adolescents with PCO as uh, severe acne and hirsutism and deserves clinical uh, and medical consultation. So the best treatment of hyperandrogenism is lifestyle modification of the obese patients which is a first-line therapy, usually for patients with PCOS. Diet and physical activity, low glycemic index diet, low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, physical activity and exercise. We have to differentiate between physical activity and exercise. When you are talking to your patient, she says, I am working, I go to my work, I am uh, moving at home and so on. This is physical activity. Any body movement produced by skeletal muscles that requires energy expansion. But you should instruct your patients that you have to have some exercise, which is muscle strengthening activity requiring physical effort carried out to sustain or improve health and fitness. And for adult women between 18 and 64 years, they should have a minimum of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity, 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity or equivalent of both. While uh, they should have exercise of uh, at least uh, two consecutive days per week. When the patient is coming to you and she's an adolescent, she has to have some uh, more activity, physical activity of a minimum of 60 minutes per day of most days of the week, moderate to vigorous intensity. And we have uh, to perform exercise for at least three times weekly. If the patient has good improvement of the lifestyle, including physical activity and exercise, this is quite sufficient for treating most cases of PCOS and hyperandrogenism. Adding metformin to this lifestyle modification did not improve the menstrual cycle, pregnancy rate, body mass indices, or increased serum level of sex hormone binding globulins in a recent study. One of the important lines of treatment of hyperandrogenism is to prescribe oral contraceptive pills, which are responsible for slowing hair growth in 60 to 100% uh, of women with hyperandrogenism. So, healthy education, lifestyle modification, and COS are the crucial uh, lines of treatment of hyperandrogenism. 
androgenism, and this is very important, particularly for adult women and for adolescents who are at risk or with a diagnosis of PCOS. I have to prescribe COCs for this case, which type of COCs is preferred? There is no preparation superior uh, in PCOS on, uh, over the others. The WHO guidelines should be followed for relative and absolute contraindications. We have to consider natural estrogen preparations, blanching efficacy, metabolic risk profile, side effects, cost, and availability of these COCs. But generally speaking, we have to use the lowest effective estrogen dose of 20 to 30 micrograms ethanyl estradiol or equivalent, with a success rate, as I told you, of 60 to 100 percent of cases. In a meta-analysis of 42 studies, suppression of serum total and free testosterone concentrations on patients with PCOS was similar with 20 micrograms versus 30 micrograms. Uh, uh, is. But you have to avoid COCs with preparations that may lead to hyperandrogenism. We are treating hyperandrogenism. It seems illogic to prescribe a preparation with levonorgestrel, for example, which is uh, associated with increased androgenic uh, uh, activity of this patient. And you should typically choose one that contains the progestin with low or neutral and androgenic activity like norethindrone acetate. Some clinicians prefer to start with a COCs containing an anti-androgenic progestins like prosperinone or cibrotrone acetate. Prosperinone is a very weak anti-androgenic structure related uh, progesterone related to spironolactone with uh, a possible complication of venous thromboembolism. So if you look to the generations of progestins, you can see we have to select one of the first generation progestin containing COCs like norethindrone acetate, and you have to avoid second generation preparations containing levonorgestrel or norgestrel and cibrotrone acetate is one is preferred as a treatment of hyperandrogenism. Actually, it is famous for treating cases of hyperandrogenism, but you have to uh, recognize that it is associated with hepatotoxicity. So you have to control and follow up uh, liver functions in those cases. The third generation preparations can be prescribed and it's better to prescribed rosperinone containing uh, COCs because of its similarity to spironolactone as a fourth generation progestin, but uh, it is associated with venous thromboembolism uh, risk, increased, little bit increased risk of the venous thromboembolism. So don't forget health education, lifestyle modification, weight loss for obese patients, and COCs are the best lines of treatment of hyperandrogenism. Now, the patient is not satisfied of these lines of treatment, and she comes to you again and complaining of the uh, uh, clinical presentations of hyperandrogenism, so you have to add some cosmetic therapy for at least six months, and these uh, therapies can be prescribed for patients with uh, risks related to COCs like increased body mass index, hyperlipidemia, or hypertension. So they are afraid of using COCs. Some versions are afraid of using COCs. Uh, so you can add some uh, anti-androgenic uh, lines of treatment and some cosmetic therapies. Of course, cosmetic therapies are dealt with by the uh, dermatologists and the uh, you have to stress that COCs uh, are the best uh, lines of treatment of hyperandrogenism in 60 to 100% of cases. In addition to treating hyperandrogenism, uh, the COCs have the value of preventing, preventing endometrial hyperplasia. 
TUCs inhibit gonadotrophin secretion, increase serum uh, uh, sex hormone binding globulin, decrease serum total and free testosterone concentrations with some secondary mechanisms like decreased adrenal androgen secretions inhibiting the preferred conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone by inhibiting the binding of dihydrotestosterone to androgen receptors. Some doctors prescribe metformin for patients with hyperandrogenism. This is not correct because insulin lowering agents are not uh, effective lines of treatment of patients with hyperandrogenism. But the patient still complains of hirsutism, acne, or uh, uh, alopecia. So we have to add some anti androgenic to COCs. And it's better to give COCs to anti-androgenic because these anti-androgenic drugs are teratogenic. If the patient gets pregnant, uh, she is liable to have some teratogenicity of these drugs. So it's better to prescribe COCs with the anti-androgenic drugs uh, for six to uh, month to 12 months uh, until completion of the anti-androgenic treatment. And of course, the teratogenicity is related to uh, male fetal under virilization uh, uh, of the pregnancy if it occurs unintentionally. But take care of liver toxicity, most of these uh, lines of treatment. Is it possible to prescribe anti androgenic drug without giving the patient COCs? This is True, if the patient is having intrauterine contraceptive device, which uh, uh, gives us safety regarding unintentional pregnancy. And in such cases, we can prescribe anti-androgenic drugs like spironolactone. Also, COCs are contraindicated or poorly tolerated in uh, some uh, patients, so in such cases, anti androgenic uh, sh treatment should be considered uh, for treating hirsutism and androgen related alopecia with precautions to avoid unintentional pregnancy. But we have to tell our patients that the role of anti androgens remains controversial and the duration of treatment is very prolonged, it should be at least six months to one year and actually it is not highly effective. What is best anti-androgenic drug? There is no uh, type superior to the others. Spironolactone is aldosterone and uh, androgen receptor antagonist structurally similar to progestins, competes with dihydrotestosterone for binding to androgen receptors and inhibits enzymes involved in the androgen biosynthesis so it works on the receptors and prevents form formation of dihydrotestosterone the dose is around 50 to 100 milligrams daily and increases gradually up to 100 milligram twice daily as needed but we should know that it has some side effects including potential teratogenicity so we have to prescribe an effective form of contraception. Hyperkalemia, uh, which is really a problem in women with normal renal function and uh, aldosterone secretion. Some gastrointestinal discomfort or irregular menstrual bleeding. Uh, that's often managed by switching or uh, adding, switching to or adding disease. Some Doctors prescribe cibrotron acetate, which may be associated with some uh, complications like hepatotoxicity, as I told you, but it works by decreasing ovarian androgens, uh, steroid receptor complex inhibition, and decreasing LH. Some preparations, including ethinyl estradiol, 35 micrograms, and cibrotron acetate, should not be considered first line of treatment uh, 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 
due to the adverse effects of these uh, drugs, including venous thrombin and hepatotoxicity. Drospirinone is a fourth generation progesterone uh, preparation, synthetic progesterone, and it's giving uh, of, uh, actually inside COCs, it's not present uh, alone in the markets, and it's very similar to 25 milligram of spironolactone in being anti-androgenic. So we give the fourth generation COCs for this purpose with a possibility of higher risk of venous thromboembolisms and other uh, COCs containing uh, progesterone. Sometimes we prescribe venous tried, which is giving in a dose of five milligram daily, also inhibits transformation of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. It has only a partial effect. Dutastride, which is available uh, for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia, it's given in a dose of 250 to 750 milligram daily, inhibiting transformation of testosterone to the active disease. Some doctors prescribe cibrotron acetate, which may be associated with some uh, complications like hepatotoxicity, as I told you, but it works by decreasing ovarian androgens. Uh, we can give combination with COCs of anti-androgens, as I told you, hormone is not effective. Some doctors prescribe ovulation induction for those cases by clomiphenicetate, uh, metformin, or both which does not work for patients with hirsutism or other clinical hyperandrogenism. Also, if we talk about alopecia, hyper, uh, related to hyperandrogenism, we have to consider lifestyle modification, health education, weight loss, and COCs as a first line of treatment, in addition to some anti-androgenic drugs, and this is the treatment of androgen-related alopecia. One of the important lines of treatment of hyperandrogenism is to prescribe oral contraceptive pills, which are responsible for slowing hair growth in 60 to 100% uh, of women with hyperandrogenism. Adding metformin is given for weight control, not for treating hyperandrogenism, for patients with obesity, with increased body mass index more than 25 kilograms per square meter, for particularly adolescents in high metabolic risk group, including diabetes risk factors, impaired glucose tolerance, or high risk uh, ethnic groups, and for management of metabolic features after failure of COCs and lifestyle medications. What about lean PCO cases? Lifestyle modification is not to weight loss, but to weight maintenance and avoid the weight gain, also to avoid obesity. Diet modification, consumption of ample amounts of vegetables, some fruits, vitamin D, calcium, and herbs, regular exercise also to treat hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance and to avoid hyperandrogenism. But if the patient has inadequate clinical response, we can add metformin as a treatment of insulin resistance, not to weight loss. And sometimes we can give myo-inositol uh, along with an additional management uh, of hirsutism, menstrual dysfunction, acne, uh, and these lines by topical treatment by anti-androgenic drugs, menstrual dysfunction by progesterone alone or COC is not effective. Some doctors prescribe ovulation induction for those cases by clomiphenicetate, uh, metformin, or both, which does not work for patients with hirsutism or other clinical disturbances, particularly insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. This is a common feature of the syndrome both in obese and lean women. Because PCOS pathophysiology means insulin resistance and 
pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. So insulin resistance leads to compensatory hyperinsulinemia, and this compensatory hyperinsulinemia stimulates theca cells to increase androgen senses by stimulation by the uh, with the uh, with the aid of some co-gonadotropins by stimulation of pituitary gland to increase gonadotropins by stimulation of liver to decrease sex hormone binding globulin all these uh, mechanisms lead to hyperandrogenemia so all cases of PCOS will have insulin resistance even lean patients with compensatory hyperinsulinemia and hyperandrogenism but some of them will have dysglycemia which means two time increased risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus so they are at high risk of developing diabetes twice more than equivalent age POCs. Adding metformin is given for weight control, not for treating hyperandrogenism, for patients with obesity, with increased body mass index more than 25 kilograms per square meter, for particularly adolescents in high metabolic risk group, including diabetes risk factors, impaired glucose tolerance, or high risk uh, ethnic groups, and for management of this to treat metabolic disturbances. For treating insulin resistance, we have to give insulin sensitizing agents like metformin, like inositol, and others. Metformin is given to decrease gluconeogenesis, to decrease lipogenesis, and to increase glucose uptake in the liver, skeletal muscles, adipose tissue, and ovaries. And this is very important even in lean patients. But the side effects include GIT troubles, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency on long-term use. It's given in a dose with uh, 500 milligram twice daily and can be increased incrementally uh, uh, every one to two weeks. The maximal dose is around 850 milligram twice day. As I told you, if it is associated with lifestyle modifications, it's good. And lifestyle modification is advantageous over metformin for treating weight gain and treating hyperandrogenism, also for treating metabolic disturbance. And this uh, metformin with in, uh, lifestyle modification line of treatment is important for patients with increased body mass index more than 25 kg per square meter. Adolescents with a clear diagnosis of PCOS or symptoms of PCOS before the diagnosis is made and in high risk metabolic risk groups including diabetic uh, risk factors, uh, impaired glucose tolerance or high risk ethnic we can give other types of anti-obesity treatment and actually this uh, line should be given after failure of metformin which is a cheap drug available elsewhere and you have to consider cause, contraindication, side effects, uh, variable availability and regularity status pregnancy needed to be avoided. One of the famous uh, anti-obesity lines of treatment is myoinositol and dichiroinositol, which is naturally uh, uh, nutrient supplement that acts as a second messenger and has been shown to play a role in insulin signaling transduction. So the recommendations in any form should be uh, currently considered experimental in BCOS with an emerging evidence of efficacy, highlighting the need for further research. So metformin is the best anti-obesity line of treatment of such cases. Now, we discussed hyperandrogenism and metabolic disturbances. What about abnormal trying leading? In uh, some cases coming with abnormal time bleeding and you diagnose BCOS by two of the three criteria for diagnosing them and 
you realized that the cause of this abnormal bleeding is PCOS. Those cases, if they are uh, infertile, you can give them cyclic estrogen progesterone therapy for six, uh, three to six months until gaining regularity of cycles. If they are uh, fertile and they don't need uh, further children, you can uh, prescribe combined COCs uh, with the considerations discussed before. Basically, polycystic ovarian syndrome is diagnosed by the presence of two of the following hyperandrogenism, clinically or biochemically, menstrual and ovulatory dysfunction, or ovarian change of polycystic ovary by ultrasonography. If you find two of these three criteria, you can find uh, you can have a diagnosis of polycystic ovary. And I have to stress on the recent recommendations that ultrasonographic diagnosis of polycystic ovary depends on the presence of at least 20 follicles with a diameter of 2 to 9 millimeters or ovarian volume more than 10 cubic centimeter. But these are the diagnostic criteria for polycystic ovarian syndrome in a female in the reproductive age, usually coming for menstrual abnormalities or infertility. But what about cases? So the women with PCOS are at greater cardiovascular risk with evidence of a high risk of women in their 30s and 40s. Middle-aged women with PCOS exhibit only a moderately unfavorable cardiometabolic profile compared to age-matched group, as proven in a recent uh, randomized controlled uh, trial. Particularly in those cases with increased body mass index and waist risk. So don't ignore cardiovascular complications, and you have to. Uh, uh, highlight these complications during counseling of your patients. Sometimes the patient with PCOS comes to you and says, I don't need to treat PCOS because I don't need children. I have enough number of children. No, the treatment is not for children only. It's not an infertility treatment. We are treating a syndrome of uh, metabolic, uh, androgenic, uh, cardiovascular uh, and health uh, problems. One of the health problems of the BCOS is pregnancy complications related uh, to BCOS, including miscarriage or early loss of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, preterm labor or birth, and cesarean section or uh, cesarean section uh, delivery, which is increased risk due to the complications of BCOS. So the PCOS is a syndrome should be uh, clear in your mind when you are dealing with this effect. Dutastride, which is available uh, for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia, it's given in a dose of 250 to 750 milligram daily, inhibiting transformation of testosterone to the active testosterone.